Hey everyone, really quick before we jump in, I'm excited to announce that the Transforming Cities podcast is now a part of the Smarter Living Podcast Network. Now what this means practically is that Smarter Living is becoming your one-stop destination for the best content across the entire multifamily industry. Head on over to smarterliving.io to get on the list. All right, let's jump into the episode. On this live episode of Transforming Cities, I welcomed Anna McKay and Jesse Ledesma of Shortstack Housing. During a live event, we jumped into the thesis behind Shortstack as it relates to missing middle housing, the founder story, and a deeper dive into the process and product that is Shortstack. We also covered a great Q&A at the end, which I invite you to listen to. Be sure to let me know how you like this format and get on the list at transformingcities.io for future guest announcements. Let's get into the episode. Really excited for today's live. We have, again, Anna McKay on the left and Jesse Ledesma on the right. Anna uh, has a company, development company called Sister City in Portland. Um, Jesse has homework development also in Portland. And today we are going to cover uh, the topic of missing middle housing and specifically as it relates to their short stack product, um, process and product, really. Um, we'll dive into the founder's journey a little bit, the short stack process the short stack product we have some great slides and examples of that work um, and then we'll dive into q a as usual towards the end so without further ado i would love to dive into short stack and kick it over to you two welcome to the to the show today um, i would like to hear just a little bit about the thesis of short stack if you don't mind kind of let the audience and the listeners know what that's all about where it came from and and what are the challenges that you're trying to to solve thanks chris thanks so much for having us today and a big hello to everyone listening we were really excited to see the rsvp turnout so um fun to be sharing this space with you all this morning um all right so let's talk about short stack and in almost every way what short stack is is a solution for what's known in housing as the missing middle. And generally what this refers to is this kind of gap in the housing continuum where there's like this robust regulated affordable housing, there's a robust market rate affordable housing, but housing attainable to middle earners, it's really a challenge to develop. And so oftentimes it's just not there. And that's certainly the case in Oregon and in Portland. And we know that it's that way in many cities across the country. I think something like a third of Oregon families are what are considered um, cost burdened when it comes to housing. And that means they're spending more than 30% of their income on housing. So in Portland specifically, um, 50% of renters are cost burdened and 25% of homeowners are cost burdened. And so there's this real call to create attainable housing. And that's what Shortstack does. But while we're at it, you know, there are these kind of interlinked challenges to housing and development generally that Jesse and I are trying to solve for with the creation of what Shortstack is, which we'll get into. But one of them is that um, communities of color are the hardest hit by this housing gap. And we're seeing that those who create these places and spaces, AKA developers are often um, not representative of the community as a whole. Something like 97% of real estate executives are white and male. And so we're just gonna tackle all of it all at once <laughs> with short stack. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and tell, tell us a little bit about the premise of the actual product too, because I know there's obviously, um, you know, very, very tangible and very real issues that are sort of setting the foundation for that. But when it comes to um, your approach to trying to help solve at least part of that, that issue, that, that problem, that challenge, um, I know we have a slide up here that kind of helps explain that, but, but walk us through this a little bit. Totally. So the missing middle is not only that kind of gap in attainable housing. Jesse and I also think that it is the scale at which we're building too and where we're building. So what Shortstack does is to create a replicable kit of parts that can be deployed specifically and ideally on urban infill sites. So these are the missing teeth in a smile in your neighborhood. It's the double lot. It's the overgrown parking lot. 
um, what ShortStack does is to create a quick um, solution for creating housing in these spaces and trying to take away what is traditionally like extremely high touch development, which is infill development. Um, so Jesse, do you want to talk about like how we get there? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think this is kind of ties right into the founder's journey as well for Anna and I kind of developing this interconnected systemic approach to housing. I would say that like the, the root of the concept was really born out of one major opportunity and one major challenge in our industry that Anna and I came together um, really quickly in our thinking around. And the opportunity uh, in Oregon was uh, born out of House Bill 2001, which was a state house bill that basically banned single family zones in jurisdictions over a certain size. It was pretty revolutionary and it and it sort of backtracked a lot of the redlining and racist planning that was put into place um, kind of in, you know, throughout the decades of the last century. And with that, cities such as Portland and all jurisdictions over a certain size across the state um, basically upzoned residential neighborhoods and upzoned middle housing neighborhoods to allow more infill housing density. So huge opportunity there. You know, a lot of land available to develop small scale, mid scale multifamily housing, which is awesome. But the challenge is, as Anna says, is that infill housing, small to mid scale multifamily housing is super inefficient. It's really high touch. If we're taking this on a project by project or site by site or building by building basis, it's, it's not nearly as efficient as developing a large scale, you know, 100 units at a time, or frankly, as efficient as a a home builder who's cranking out a single family home of the same plan. So we have this great opportunity, lots of land available with zoning that supports mid and small scale urban infill housing. But the process it, that we've established in, as our industry is super inefficient. Mm. So we well, got before we get better. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. No, yeah. And, and I would say before we get into that actual process and, and product that you have developed, I would love to, I always love to hear the founder story. So let's take a brief side road here and talk about that because you both have a really great background, a really excellent history, especially as women in an industry that I think is so driven by by men, right? And I think that's kind of the elephant in the room. So I, I love having women on the show to just represent a growing force across the industry. And both of you come from really strong backgrounds. You've done some amazing work together. And I would love to hear about how did you actually link up and become what is now the short stack team? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for kicking that off, Chris. Um, so my background, I've been a real estate developer in the Portland area for about 16 years now. The first almost half of that, I was pretty focused on developing regulated affordable housing development. So that's low income housing tax credits, HUD sources, USDA, RD sources for nonprofit and for profit ownership. Loved that work, uh, learned a lot along the way and just was really drawn into community focused development work. I pivoted into commercial real estate development for a family office in Portland. Uh, Beam Development for a while was director of development there doing mixed use, uh, fun retail office projects, hospitality in Portland, Central East Side. Um, also learned a lot of great things there. And coming out of that um, was really realizing that there can be a better marriage between public financing like the LIHTC tools we see and private financing like we see for commercial real estate development. Mm -hmm. And so I launched my firm homework about two years ago, was really inspired by Anna launching Sister City about a year before that. It was kind of one of those wake up calls uh, like, wow, we can do that uh, <laughs> on our own. Cool, let me try that too. Uh, so it was really actually inspired by Anna going mm -hmm. out on her own. And we um, linked up and kind of just had a mind meld about this short stack opportunity um, really around it, the marriage of Anna's experience raising private equity and raising funds and both of our experience developing housing. And so there was just an immense amount of complementary kind of skill share between mm. us, but also just the goals and the philosophies of our individual firms. Totally. And, and Anna, how about you? I, I, I know a little bit because we've, we've spoken about this and you joke with me that, you know, I actually had a son during COVID and you said that you kind of, you had, you birthed your company during COVID. So yes. <laughs> I always think that's hilarious. Baby. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. So I come, um, at real estate kind of through the back door. Um, I, like Jesse have a degree in architecture and practiced as an intern architect for many years and actually 
segued into construction and education. And it was, you know, on my, my own personal just development journey, I figured that if I had the design taken care of and the build taken care of, if I could start to wrap my head around the finance, then I could really have a uh, authentic say in how places get made. And so, and, and kind of harness that for what I perceive as, as good in a community focused brand of real estate development. Um, so I linked up with Kevin Cavanaugh at Guerrilla Development in 2013 and was the director of development there for about seven years before starting Sister City, but really cut my teeth on some um, kind of creative um, uh, financing structures, some um, some of the first crowd investing uh, for new construction in the in the country, um, experimenting with what I would call internal subsidization and in mixed use buildings where market rate units offset deeply affordable units. And Sister City kind of was taking that to the next level. And mm. um, this is, you know, kind of a slide showing some of the cool projects Jesse and I have had the opportunity to work on and to to co-develop. Um, but most recently I finished uh, Child's House, which is an affordable housing project here in um, Southeast Portland, co-developed with Catholic Charities of Oregon. And it's um, completely financed by donations from parishioners. And so there's this like incredible flexibility that Catholic Charities has to get folks housed really quickly and without some of the red tape that's associated with regulated affordable housing. No shade. I think we need all of it, but this is like a special tool in in their housing continuum. Yeah. And, you know, notably, it's also the first um, cross laminated timber housing project to be affordable in, in Portland and in Oregon. So um, it's in a way a, a dupe for short stack. It's kind of a similar scale and it, it really is a practical um, case study for what we're trying to get faster and faster with, with short stack. Yeah. And I, and I have to say even short stack aside, I have conversations all the time with different developers and, and marketing directors and small agency owners across the country. And time and time again, there are multiple projects on this slide here that people come to me and say, I love the work that they do. I love this kind of work. The work coming out of Portland is really unique. It's very innovative. Um, and there's just sort of a, a palette and a texture to it that you don't necessarily see across the rest of the country. And I think that's, that's something that you're, you're certainly, you've, you've been able to hang your hat on and you're continuing to do that with short stack today. Um, let's talk about all of the people actually involved in short stack, because I mean, you are the representatives of short stack, but there's, there's more than just the two of you. There's a lot happening behind the scenes. Talk to us about that. And then we'll kind of dive into the, the process of short stack. Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, you know, in, in describing some of the challenges in the industry, Anna mentioned that oftentimes real estate developers and those who are financing and making decisions about how we build are not representative of the community. And we've tried to be really intentional in building our team um, to make sure that we have just an amazing team of experts that is more representative of our community. And we've been really intentional about bringing in folks um, either on the investment side or as development partners um, to make sure that we're getting a lot of different opinions and a lot of different points of view um, in the development, you know, in the whole process, really start to finish, including financing, investment, the development world and construction. Um, so we're really excited. This We have an amazing team and that's really the backbone of any real estate development effort. The developer is kind of like a lone wolf operator. Um, the, you know, it, it's not really how it works in, in the field. Um, and so we're really proud of the team that we built and, and the partnerships in particular that we've put together. Thanks for listening to this episode of Transforming Cities brought to you by Authentic. Authentic delivers premier multifamily brand experiences and smart digital marketing. Our proven approach aims to accelerate leasing velocity, boost rental rates, and increase long-term value. Simply put, we see brand as a business asset. You can find out more at AuthenticFF.com. Well, without further ado, let's jump into the short stack process. And I, I, I love stuff like this. I love slides like this. So I, when I first saw this, I was 
super excited inside because I mean, building blocks with my son aside, like the idea that you can kind of deconstruct, start with something and, and, and work your way backwards and kind of figure out the parts and pieces of it. So the following slides here for the viewers, um, we have actually three that kind of build upon itself. And I know Anna, you mentioned that you don't necessarily spend a ton of time on these slides, but I think they're just really fascinating. So, um, Anna or Jesse, do you mind walking us through kind of the succession of these, uh, and, and how the, the process of short stack begins to come together. Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, mentioning your son, I think is like a real logical place to start because essentially what we're doing are creating fundamentally Legos that go together in different, um, different arrangements, depending on what the zoning is on a site and what the site dimensions are. And there are two, like primary drivers for how we establish the original, what we'll call the, the module of short stack. And that is the, the kind of basis Portland city lot, which is a 50 by 100 foot lot, but also um, some really common lengths and widths of mass timber panels. So mm. like child's house are, short stack projects are what are called hybrid mass timber buildings where we have mass timber floors and roof but the walls are um, stick frame and those can be panelized off-site or they can be built rapidly on site but the idea is that we're going really fast we're flying these like panels in and the walls go up and that whole process takes you know all together maybe three or four days versus two weeks, um, mm -hmm. which would be a traditional, maybe two or three weeks traditionally. And so uh, we have every one bedroom is the same. Every two bedroom is the same. Every three bedroom is the same with short stack and they can stack in different ways. Um, like two bed, two one bedrooms equals one three bedroom. And mm -hmm. um, as we kind of mentioned earlier, these are three and four story walk ups. So uh, we're taking great care to design around systems and logically running MEP through cores. And as long as we're stacking those, then we're really uncovering this amazing amount of efficiency in the design and build process. And from there, really, the, the options are endless. We typically end up like more... Um, you know, unit stacking than maybe this diagram displays, but there is a ton of flexibility and that's really what, what we're trying to highlight here. Um, and yeah, I think it's important to note too, in this slide and with what Anna's describing about kind of these base like unit modules is that we're really focused also on family sized housing units, which are right. really the most difficult to develop and build because the NOI per square foot is less than if you're building a micro studio or a super tiny one bedroom. And that's why you see that a lot of new construction is really focused on these tiny units because they can generate a lot more rent per square foot. Uh, so when we're focused on two and three bedroom size units, we have to get even more efficient with those floor plans um, because there's kind of our, inherently like a development headwinds against those unit types. So we're really excited to work with the WPA team here on get, how efficient can we get for these two and three bedroom units that are still on this regular um, kind of grid panel pattern that Anna described, but that are still really functional, really beautiful, really desirable units. And that sort of set us up for a couple design rules that we developed. You know, Anna mentioned these are walk-up units, which means they're the entry is from the exterior. And so one of our design rules is that each unit has daylight on at least two sides. And a lot of the units have daylight on three sides. That allows for, you know, just kind of that, that connection to the outdoors, that trauma-informed design where you're not stuck in a dark hallway, but also just for cross ventilation and a lot of other um, kind of, you know, health in your housing, um, you know, intentions and goals. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things that I found really interesting about this is that with the scalability of the way that the process is laid out here, it really could be something that you put in a backyard or you could put in a completely empty lot, a lot that's ready to go for a, a smaller scale development. Was that always the thinking going into this that we need to have a process that can, you know, we can plop it in a backyard of a lot that's big enough, or we can, uh, we, you know, we could sort of like essentially lease it out to, or, or, or kind of sell this product and this blueprint to fellow developers across Portland to build something 
bigger? Definitely. I think our intention has always been to create a licensable product that works not only in Portland, but elsewhere. And Jesse, you might agree. Um, but it's kind of like we had to start at multifamily and we're like working. And, and the assumption there is that those are rentals and we're working our way down to a smaller for sale, for sale module. Um, but uh, there's always been a driver to continue to find ways to make the development process more equitable and uh, approachable. And those are some long-term goals of short stack is to become this product that, you know, whether you have a lot of experience in development or less, when you license it, you're getting not only blueprints, but you're getting, you know, Pat, like prescriptive pathways of like, okay, this is what your, you know, spreadsheets might look like. This is how you approach private equity. This is how you talk to a bank. Um, and those are aspirational at the moment, but they're definitely cooking and um, getting, um, you know, memorialized as we go. Cause I think both yeah. Jesse and I are like, let's do it and mm -hmm. kind of record that process and let that be the thing that makes this a product, which right is maybe a little bit of a differentiator in the market. Well, let's let's flip over to the design side of the coin because I I would say from someone who is knows enough to be dangerous that when you're doing something that is replicable and that is arguably faster than the norm, oftentimes design falls by the wayside in the development world. And I don't know that that's really the case with short stack, which is really refreshing to see that these buildings can be done in a way that is um, understated and subtle, but still really beautiful. And so I would love to transition into the product side of it, kind of this, this, the either, and, and feel free to tackle this question any way you, you, you two would like, but from a design standpoint, is it, is it more about the speed with which this can be built? Is it about the finishes? Is it about, is it about everything? Kind of how do you think about the product side of short stack as compared to, I don't know, let's say kind of like a traditional multifamily project that's 400 units that gets built somewhere near downtown kind of thing. I can, I can jump in on this. I think I'll kind of go back and ground us in that missing middle scale that Anna started out describing because the zoning that we're really um, focused on here, at least for our first launch, are these kind of small scale sites, let's say 5,000 to 15,000 square feet sites uh, that allow for three or four story buildings. And there are a lot, there's a, there are a lot of properties available that fit that description because these have historically been kind of hard to develop and the zoning and density wasn't quite there. Now that we have the zoning and density, that's great. Um, but as I mentioned, it's still super inefficient to develop a, a project that big on like a custom kind of boutique one-off scale. You're just going to spend a lot on architecture and engineering and entitlements. Um, whereas with the short stack model, we're, we spent quite a bit of time kind of developing this base design that we're looking at such that it can be deployed across multiple sites like super efficiently. But as you mentioned, Chris, we don't want it to look like a cookie cutter box. And I think it's worth mentioning that we've used the term module a couple of times to, to describe the unit types that we're stacking and configuring for short stack. But we aren't just we aren't building these as a volumetric modular construction effort. And that is certainly an important you know, part of our industry that I know a lot of folks are focused on, um, even with mass timber. And I think there's a lot of room to improve our construction uh, technology through modular construction. Um, but we've focused this short stack product on more of like a flat pack panelized mm. construction approach, which we think is uh, more efficient for these urban infill sites, you know, where we're not building 50 boxes here or 50 units at a time, right? We've got these kind of smaller scale projects. So we don't want to have to pay for the craning and the trucking associated with these modular volumetric modular construction sites. Mm -hmm. um, so we've got this kind of flat pack panelized approach, which allows us, I think, to have a little more fun with the design because we're not completely constrained by that trucking modular volume. Mm -hmm. And so we've designed um, the team at Works Progress Architecture, WPA, I think has done a fantastic job of establishing sort of in plan, it, you would see it as like a pinwheel where we have multiple small buildings that circulate around an interior courtyard that's open to the 
sky. And so that really, you know, is driving some of those design rules I talked about in terms of access to daylight, natural ventilation. It also has, an, it creates an opportunity for some outdoor communal space in the middle where you would typically, if you were taking a look at this kind of site and you're saying, how can I maximize FAR? How can I maximize developable area? You would build a box and you would have a door into that box with a lobby and a hallway and a double loaded corridor. This is right. not as efficient from a development return on equity standpoint per square foot, but we get there, we find those efficiencies in the replicability that we're talking about. And we think that it's important enough to, to kind of blow open these small projects such that we have a lot of daylight to the units and that these are different types of units than you would typically see in a double loaded corridor apartment building. And again, on that missing middle topic, you know, a lot of the sites that we're looking at and the zones that we're looking at truly straddle these zones of like what have traditionally been single family home lots, which are adjacent to both of our short stack sites, and then kind of taller buildings on a commercial corridor, which are also adjacent to our short stack sites. So these become the bridge between those two um, building typologies. And uh, we think that it's a good example of how you don't necessarily have to max out density to create enough units that you have an efficient development process. Mm. Going, I'm, I'm popping ahead here a couple slides, just going back to your comment earlier about um, the design of these and how you're trying to have windows on at least, I think you said two sides of the building, but this inner corridor provides quite a bit of additional light as well to all of the units. Um, kind of flipping back and forth here, I, I'm curious how much flexibility there is in the short stack system Let's say I come to you and I say, hey, I want to do this in my neighborhood. Um, these are really beautiful designs. What, what kind of additional flexibility do I have? And I think my question is, going back to some of the earlier process slides, do you, are you able to say it, it's sort of like the world is your oyster in terms of the system that we have set up and you can kind of create and customize um, at will or are there specific you know, design rules and principles that one must sort of stay aligned with when developing a short stack? product? I think that, you know, we're striving to create something that is flexible and, you know, we're actually experiencing our first um, like licensing relationship. So a lot of these conversations are happening in real time, like, Hey, my site's super skinny. And how are we going to address that? And how can short stack grow and shrink to accommodate that? I think um, fundamentally when you're looking, if we go back one more slide, maybe one more, you can extrapolate that there are four building masses here. And I would call each one a short stack. Mm -hmm. And this is a 10,000 square foot site. When we're thinking of a 5,000 square foot site, which is obviously half that, it might just be that one of those short stack grows by an additional module. And the circulation still happens on the exterior, but the corridor is happening on one side, the like courtyard vibe is happening on one side of the building or another. So when we're talking multifamily, we're, we're pinwheeling, we're, you know, addressing more linearly, but um, we're still using the same basis of design and approach to design uh, regardless of the site. And we're actually uh, testing the short stack mo module, I would say, on like a cottage cluster basis right now on for um, another site outside of Portland that could be more of an affordable home ownership development model, which we're really excited about. So that's like really taking it down to the scale of one two bedroom unit that is deployed then on, you know, standalone units on a site in a cottage cluster configuration yeah. using the same building techniques. Is there anything else that is that you two feel like is really unique? from a design perspective about the short stack model that should be um, highlighted or discussed further. Obviously mass timber is a, is a big part of it. Maybe we haven't talked too much about that yet, um, but feel free to shine a light on anything else that you feel like is important to mention with, with short stack as it starts to roll out. Um, maybe I would just give one uh, more flavor of information around the mass timber construction for those who aren't as familiar with it. So yeah. in terms of mass timber panels that are structural panels, there are in our region, there are basically two major kind of types. So one is cross laminated timber, which is shortened to CLT. And that is essentially, you have two buys that are alternating um, directions to create a super strong 
large scale panel, or you have mass plywood panel, which is shortened to MPP, which is essentially exactly that. It's huge plywood panels as are manufactured in Oregon as well. And so we tested this design really along the way for either of those panel types. And there are, there are some kind of regular dimensions in terms of the panel widths and thicknesses. So we were really excited to test those two panel types as we go to remain flexible for mass timber. Mm. And it feels to us like that might be the best way in terms of cost efficiency and just availability of these products is to remain as flexible as possible to the like manufacturer such that you have, we, you know, treat it more like buying out a lumber package when we get to the buyout stage. Um, I would love to transition into some Q and a, um, and then for anyone listening, be sure to check out shortstackhousing.com, get a little bit more information, sign up for the mailing list. I know that we're still a little bit early in the, the announcement phase of short stack, but I think this is a great time to get on the list and to learn more about it. Um, I'm going to jump in here and, and field a few questions. If you don't mind, Eric sent this one in early. He was asking about getting builders on board, uh, with sort of this mass timber movement. I actually had a guest on a couple of weeks ago in the mass timber world as well. And I know that this is an ongoing challenge and conversation. Um, where did the, where did the two of you land on that question? Hey, Eric, it's good to see you. And I know that Eric is asking this from the state of Virginia, which has less access to, to mass timber manufacturing facilities, but there are some coming online in the Southeast, um, thanks to Walmart and to other, um, you know, advantageous things coming together down there. But um, this is something that Jesse and I really thought about early on is in the Pacific Northwest, it feels like mass timber is like completely exploding right now and it's everywhere. And we saw that as like an incredible opportunity to make sure that all sorts of builders were getting exposure to this typology and giving themselves an opportunity to position themselves as experts now, because it's like, it's this great equalizing moment where anybody can step up and kind of cut their teeth in and become mass t mass timber installers or designers. And so we actually worked with partners at Swinnerton and Timber Lab and the National Association of Minority Contractors to create this eight week curriculum for um, kind of for uh, minority contractors to get caught up to speed on what it takes to build with mass timber. And um, that process we we ran last year and it was it was successful. And I think ultimately it's about developers taking that extra moment to really share and educate when they can, even if there is no return on that investment yeah. from a financial standpoint, there is an incredible return on it from, you know, a pool of qualified contractors standpoint down the road and just bringing up other folks as we ourselves are coming up. Mm -hmm. I think at this scale we're building at too, we have the opportunity to sort of demystify mass timber construction because it's actually remarkably uh, simple construction type. You know, it's like these big panels that are coming together with post and beam or a framed wall holding it up. Um, and at this scale that we're building three or four stories, you don't need huge pieces of equipment to put it together. And so we love the idea of kind of blowing open that pool of mass timber experts and really um, helping maybe smaller residential contractors scale up into multifamily housing mm -hmm. construction and gain expertise in mass timber construction along the way. Yeah. That's a great point. Um, well, we're getting some questions in here rapid fire now. So let me jump into a few others. We have a, another Eric. Let's see if this does fit. Okay. So essentially Eric's asking about the, the risks and insurance costs, given the flat pack offsite approach. Um, is that, does that needle move sort of up or down or has that, is it too early to tell or, or, or how is that? Yeah, it's it's too early to tell, um, on the kind of insurance risk, you know, builder's risk or wrap insurance for condo development. So far, there is no differentiator between mass timber construction and conventional stick built, even though mass timber construction performs better, like in earthquakes and fire testing. It just there hasn't been enough buildings built with that model for the insurance carriers to make any adjustments. So I think yeah. that's in the next decade. Got another one here from uh, Laura. Great to see you, Laura. Um, she's asking about 
rentals versus for sale products and the, the driver behind that? Yeah, I can jump in on that. We're really interested in both models. And we think on the affordable housing workforce, affordable continuum, really that 60 to 100 or 120 percent AMI range, we need both. And for sale homeownership is a really critical tool to build equity, uh, financial equity and equity, you know, race equity across our community in terms of the homeownership gap. Um, however, rental housing, multifamily rental housing is more straightforward to finance. And so we started with that tool because, or we started with that development model because there are more tools available to build rental housing. And so we liked the idea of prototyping the concept with rentals and then moving into home ownership. Mm. And I'll speak for myself. I have never done a for sale product before. And so rental is more my comfort zone. And our model with short stack is to build and hold these buildings super long term. So we're talking 15, 20 years where I'm really attracted to creating an asset and growing with it and learning from it and having that also speak to what the product is, like product 2.0 will be informed by and inspired by what we're learning by taking care of these, these buildings over time. Well, in the spirit of short stack, let me stack a couple questions here. So there are two that I think relate to one another. One of them comes in about elevators in the configuration. Is this is this possible? Has this been thought about? Um, and then Brian is also asking about from an accessibility standpoint, you know, how does that fit into the overall model and, and approach? So um, two questions, I think, that are related to one another. Um, so feel free to take it away. Totally. Well, it's you know, we, we started thinking about everything at, like if the short stack is the box, like everything that goes on that box, we were thinking about as like an accessory to, or another module. The basis of design of short stack does not have elevators, but we have assessed what it would take to add like an elevator core that would serve um, short stacks if there was a specific site that required one. By law in Oregon, if your building is under four stories, you don't need an elevator. Um, and I would add, we are designing the ground floor units to be either visitable or accessible, because I saw another question about visitability. So um, the upper level units are not, but the ground level units all have entries that are accessible or visitable. Yeah. And we're working with a great ADA consultant who is taking a look at all of our plans and, and confirming that visitability and accessibility across the basis of design and also site specific. Mm. Um, another one here from Christine asks about current barriers to development um, that you're you're facing and how the commercial real estate in industry and community can help support in overcoming those. Um, something we didn't really touch on, but are you facing a lot of barriers or or, or struggles with the the short stack product? No barriers, <laughs> <laughs> none at all. I would. I'll jump hey, in on Christine. this. <laughs> Um, you know, as emerging developers, as female developers, as developers who didn't like inherit a develop a development business or a portfolio of buildings from our parents, um, I'll just start from that standpoint. One of the major barriers is like a construction loan guarantee. You know, they're the kind of the whole development industry has been set up such that those who already own property and can borrow against a balance sheet or can borrow against wealth that their family has generated have access to better financing and construction debt to build more housing or build more buildings of any sort. And that's kind of like the backbone of the real estate development um, world. So when you're emerging into the field and when we're trying to build more smaller scale buildings and access, you know, financing tools that support this kind of um, AMI levels that we're trying to build, we, you know, we need favorable financing to build workforce affordable missing middle housing. And there is this barrier in terms of a construction loan guarantee that uh, we're working through with an investment partner. Um, but I think it's worth just calling that out as like a systemic barrier to emerging development. It certainly becomes a line item in the budget that otherwise wouldn't be there. And when we're developing on such razor thin margins to begin with, all, all of those things really matter. And acknowledging that, you know, even though we're emerging, we still have it a lot easier than many of our development counterparts, particularly uh, our BIPOC counterparts who are working in this field. And so um, it's it's a challenge and, mm. and one that we're, you know, slowly overcoming. 
I would add one more barrier to developing missing middle housing is that um, that definition of affordable housing. And like, you know, right now we're in an extreme housing shortage. You know, it's called a crisis in Oregon and we need housing across the continuum of affordability. And there are a lot of um, systems set up and financing tools set up to develop regulated affordable housing that's affordable at 60% AMI or below. There's a huge need for that level of housing. Don't don't get me wrong at all, a huge, enormous need. But when we're talking about housing that is between 60% and market, which is that kind of missing middle workforce affordable, um, there really aren't a lot of tools from a public financing or incentive standpoint. So one barrier is just expanding the definition of affordability, considering that, you know, 50% of renters in Portland are cost burdened, you know, really across those income spectrums. Let me toss one more at you before we wrap up, because I thought this was an interesting question. It has to do with, um, you know, lenders and in the appraisal of the, these new short stack buildings. And I think the idea of, this is a great, great question. Um, sometimes there's a difficulty understanding and valuing a new development typology. Um, again, another topic that we didn't necessarily dive into specifically, have you encountered any issues with sort of a, attaching a value to a product that has yet to really see the light of day too many times, or is it, is it more, is it sim more simple than that? Ask us in about 90 days. <laughs> <laughs> We're um, diving right into like our lender negotiations and that will lead right into our appraisals very soon. Yeah. And we are, yeah. that's an issue that we've flagged that we're going to spend a lot of time with our appraiser um, trying to show how the short stack comp is different than some of the kind of older stock walk up housing, um, you know, uh, comps, I guess, that are out there in the market and are really more akin to these kind of nicer apartment buildings, even though the scale is smaller when we're looking at what the actual unit look and feel is like. So we've got the we've got our work cut out for us to uh, show our appraisal, appraisers that these units should um, be valued differently than some of the other housing stock in the market. And I think we're at an advantage in the Pacific Northwest, specifically when it comes to mass timber. We've been building with it here for a solid decade. And every year there are more opportunities to draw comparisons to buildings that are already finished. Charles House being an, an immediate example of one that's an affordable housing project that is also a mass timber project. So um, hopefully that'll help <laughs> those conversations with appraisers. <laughs> Yeah. Maybe we'll send them this video a little bit too. Just slide that in their <laughs> inbox. Um, again, I want to, I want to thank you both for joining me today. Um, Anna and Jesse check out sister dash city.com homework dash dev.com. And then for the short stack conversation that we've been having today, short stack housing.com. I've been your host, Chris Arnold. This has been a transforming cities live, really excited for this new format. Transforming cities has been a podcast for, for a few years but these live formats are, are really exciting. So thank you for supporting that. You can find out more at transformingcities.io. Um, for there are still questions coming in. I encourage uh, Anna and Jesse to pop over to the chat um, after we end the broadcast to, to dive into some of those questions. Feel free to reach out to them, shoot me a DM. And until next time, Anna and Jesse, thank you again for, for joining us today. Thanks, Chris. Thank Thanks you. everyone who joined.